Welcome to Your Godlike Lifestyle, Part 2b. Today we're going to focus as much as we can on Section E of the outline that's Part 2. The outline which is living as sons of God. Now, who would not want to live as an adult in the family of God? Who would not want to live as a son of God? I think everybody who knows about God would want to do that. So many wonderful things in the world, but there's always a price to pay. Growing up, I remember thinking for a long time in my high school years, I would love to get a Nobel Prize and win an Olympic gold medal. Well, neither one has come to pass. There's still time to go. Not for this Olympics. I think I missed this one. But all things are possible with God. But what's my point? My point is, desire is not enough. It's not enough for you to love God and say, I love God, I am good, God loves me, God is good, he's going to take care of everything. It doesn't work that way. Because there's an enemy. And in every, in every warfare, in every lack, in every deficiency, in every challenge, the enemy is involved. We need to always realize that Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy. That's a declaration of war for a believer when he's first born again. To understand, you are at war. Yeah, your enemy has been defeated. But if you don't know he's defeated, and if you don't know how to enforce that defeat, the war is very, very real. So, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We are at war. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it better than you have ever imagined. Is your life better than you have ever imagined? Mine is. Yours should be. Have you in your life achieved anything that was better than you imagined? If you did, you really worked hard to get it. Because everything good takes effort. And everything that God gives you belongs to you. But you have to live it. You have to move into it. You have to make it your own. When the Hebrew army, the Hebrew slaves becoming an army, moving into the promised land, which God had given them, had told that to Abraham hundreds of years before. This is your land. They came into it. It's their land. God gave it to them. They knew that. The God of all the miracles from Egypt all the way to the promised land had given them that land. And they walked into the land. And what did God say to Joshua when he was taking over from Moses? He says, Be courageous. Be of good faith. Don't be afraid. And everywhere you put your foot, that I have already given it to you. Everywhere that Joshua put his foot, everywhere the army had put their foot, God had already given it to you. Given it to them. God had already given it to them. Everywhere you put your foot, God has already given to you. If you are walking in God's will and following the scriptures. Now, may, God may have given you the mountain, but you don't jump to the top of the mountain in one day. You work your way up the mountain. The kingdom of God is like a seed. Mark 4, Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a seed. If you don't understand the parable of the source, so the seed, you can't understand any other parable. That's what Jesus said. That's how important it is. It is important to know the kingdom of God is like a seed. So in a seed, it's gradual, it's sometimes slow, it's step by step. You can't take shortcuts, you can't jump steps. You got to go with the seed and let it develop. And then you start counting, you know, the leaves. Then one day you won't be able to count the leaves, much less the fruit but it's always gradual. And so it is with your life and my life and the things we want in our lives. When we start jumping things, then we start running into haste 
And the scriptures of what happens when you haste to be rich are very serious. No, we are in the kingdom of God. We are living like a seed growing step by step. And we live in joy, peace, and patience. We live in the fruit of the Spirit. We need to do that regardless of what's happening in the world. Here we are learning about being sons of God and living as son of God. We looked at some wonderful scriptures in part A, B, C, and D. And I want to highlight right up front, I never said you should stop uh, praying in the name of Jesus. I, I never said that. If you went to any church, to any Christian in this country and said, here is the pastor, here is much just an apostle, here is an apostle teaching, you should stop teaching, praying in the name of Jesus, they would absolutely tell you that this person is a fake uh, and that might, might be the nicest word. Okay? So, no. You're under the age of grace, and under the age of grace, we are blessed to be able to use the name of Jesus, and blessed to have the power of eternity to use that name, into which Jesus has vested all his power. His power is vested into his name. When Peter raised the man at the gate beautiful, and they said, how did you do that? His answer was, I didn't do it. It's the name of Jesus. Through faith in the name of Jesus that made the man whole. The name of Jesus. Through faith in the name of Jesus made the man whole. We're here today. We have the right to use the name of Jesus, and we can work miracles using the name of Jesus. But unfortunately, we're not standing still. We are here today, and time is moving on. The ages are moving on. And so we want to focus on the scriptures to see what's coming in the future and how do we prepare for them. So we saw that every word you say comes to pass. Assume every word you say comes to pass if you don't doubt in your heart. The unfortunate thing is that most people who are not trained when they get angry and say things that are terrible, they really mean it in their hearts. The times when they most believe it in their heart is when they are furious, angry, etc. Walking on offense and unforgiveness. And rage. They truly mean it and believe it in their heart. But when it comes to using God's word, it takes practice. We want to live a life where all we want in our heart is love, Christ, and the engrafted word. When we have that, then all that comes out of our mouth is the engrafted word, which we have in our heart, so it comes to pass. That's what the age of grace is really about. For you to know that we're all children of God, and we become sons of God, by maturing from milk to meat to the strong meat of the Word of God. And in fact, when we move into the strong meat of the Word of God, it requires being led by the Spirit of God, not just by the Word, but by the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And when you do that, now you're becoming an overcomer. And that's what the rest of this time from now until the rapture is about becoming an overcomer. So, the scriptures, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, on one specific point in time, the one specific mountain, be thou, remove them, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart, but believe that the things that you say come to pass as an ongoing lifestyle, if you believe that as an ongoing lifestyle, every word you say comes to pass, then when you say to a mountain on one specific occasion, be cast into the sea, then the mountain will obey it, and you'll have what you say 
for that specific occasion. So, the creation of a miracle, the moving of a mountain, the cursing of cancer and it dying, speaking healing to your body, or praying for somebody healing to another, all these miracles, all these mountains come to pass, and the foundation is that you believe that what you say all the time comes to pass. That's what it says. Now, how we have used it, how the church that is at that level has used it, church that knows how to use the name of Jesus and pray in faith, how we have used it is that we believe that every time we say the name of Jesus, it will come to pass. So when we speak, and we're speaking the name of Jesus, we believe it shall come to pass. Because after all, we're using the name of Jesus, we have the right to use the name of Jesus, and we're telling it to come to pass. And yes, that's very effective. And yes, that works. To the extent that you have the faith that the power is vested in the name, the faith in the name, the faith to speak it boldly and to believe it's done, yes, you will have it. But understand you are having it because your faith is in the name of Jesus and your faith is what you're saying when you use the name of Jesus. Which is wonderful and good here under the age of grace because we are under the age of grace. But the scriptures do not say, the scriptures, Mark eleven twenty two. 24, do not say one word about the name of Jesus. Mark 11, 22 to 24, certainly 22 and 23 specifically, have been true from God told Adam, hey, you're in charge of the earth. Whatever you say goes. You're the big shot. You are the little God over this earth. You have all thought and dominion over the earth and everything that moves up on the earth and everything that moves up on the earth, including a serpent Inhabited by the devil. Moving up on the earth. He had authority over him. He could have squashed him. Did anything he wanted to do. But he didn't do it. He did not do it. So who would pray such a prayer? Obviously Adam was supposed to pray it. Nothing about the name of Jesus. You have authority and dominion. You've been told you're in charge. My gosh, you get a job, they put you in charge of a department, and you get some unruly employees. Whose job it is to discipline, straighten them out, or fire them? It's your job. It's not the boss's job. It's not the president's job. It's your job. You're hired to do it. Well, when you became a Christian, you're hired to enforce the Word of God. Jesus shed his blood to purchase you so you'd enforce the Word of God. And the Word of God says you have an enemy who is here to steal, kill, and destroy, and you must enforce it because you have all authority and dominion in the name of Jesus. And oh, by the way, you have all authority and dominion based on Mark 11, 22 and 23. Because it has always been faith and what the person of faith says from Adam, who didn't say it, but should have, all the way up until the beginning of the age of grace. Joshua spoke to the sun and the stand still. Elijah called on fire. So, who would use such a prayer? Old Testament, all the great men and women of God did it. New Testament, Jesus did. Never heard Jesus say, in the name of Jesus, happened. No. He just said it. The only time he, only time I can think of at the moment, when he used his name was when he sent out the 70. He said, go in my name, even the, sp the spirits will obey you. And they came back and said, even the spirits obey us in your name. But then when he was leaving them, in John 14 through 17, he gives them, gives them the right to use his name, give us the right to use his name. Seven prayers, seven references to praying in the name of Jesus for the age of grace. So we're under the age of grace, and so we're not copying the examples of the great men and women of God who 
prayed in the past and changed the world and were our examples. No, we're using the name of, grace, name of Jesus because we're under grace, we're living in grace and taking advantage of the blessing he's given us. Now, if you think, if you are a pre-tribulation rapture believer, that's as good as it gets. You can use the name of Jesus until Jesus comes and takes you to here. Unfortunately, that's wrong. Okay? I don't have time to teach why it's wrong, but I'll tell you, we have a website, Rapture Made Plain, and 100% of the people were exposed to it, including myself, to the teaching, and then to the website, were believers that the rapture would be before the tribulation. 100% to my knowledge, coming out of it, change. It's true of everybody in this church. Unless we have some closet pre tribs in the church who haven't told me. But it is so ironclad and so obvious, I don't see anybody can go through the website and come out and still believe it's pre trip It's just too many scriptures that nail it from different positions. And the reason why that's true it is because the Bible is perfectly logical from Genesis to the end of Revelation. And in the logic of the Bible, based on the themes of the Bible, the only thing that's possible is for us to rise up as sons of God and deal with the devil. Not, you know, not have Jesus get the world back for us and then we turn around and give it back to the devil for a season. I mean, who would run a military campaign that way? You take the area you want, you win it, you're victorious, you defeat the enemy, and then you take all your troops and all your people and leave and turn it back over to him? That's insane. Well, that's what the pre-tribulation rapture is. Makes no sense at all. The great men and women of God who believe it have just never taken the time to study it themselves. They listen to other teachers who would create intentions, teaching at the level where they were, thought it was pre-trib because repeatedly they keep saying, God says he won't let his people go through these things. That's very true. He never has. At any point in time, the greatest example being the plagues of Moses. Didn't affect them if they were obedient. He says, everybody leave the fields and go into the building or hail will fall in you and kill you. So Egyptians went inside, Jews went inside, and those outside were killed. If some Jews were outside not believing it, hey, it's their fault. No. God has always made a way for his people to go through all trials of life. It's called partnership. And the Bible is a story of partnership from Genesis chapter 1 where Adam failed to partner with God so that Jesus had to come to rectify that mistake. The first Adam blew it, it took 6,000 years for it to be corrected. 4,000 years for Jesus to come defeat the enemy, and set it up so we would finish the work in another 2,000 years. The work is just about finished. When the church is raptured, it will be picking up where God intended for Adam and his family to be 6,000 years ago. Everything in the middle is a correction of a mistake. The age of grace is a correction of a mistake. So we are here in these ending days, in Hebrews 11, which is often called the Hall of Fame uh, uh, for people, for the faith people, or the Hall of Faith, Hall of Faith, Hall of Fame for faithful people. Not just Hall of Faith. All the great men and women of God, not all, many of the great men and women of God are referenced in Hebrews 11. And it ends with a teaching that Deborah did about a year and a half ago. Awesome teaching about let's pass on the baton. Let's pass on the baton. It's a relay. It's been a relay ever since Adam sinned. Passing on the baton. Now in a relay, people get filtered out. Some fall. Some violate the uh, passing lane and get disqualified. Some drop the baton. And some get simply beat. 
At the end of the relay, there's one winner in the race. And three people on the podium in the Olympics. It's all been a relay of the baton being passed along. And at the end of chapter 11 of Hebrews, it says, all these great men and women of God listed here could not be made perfect without us. They are waiting for us to grab the button and finish the race. You finish the race when you go from the age of grace through the age of law and you are alive and remain when Jesus returns. You're raptured, caught up with him, given a fully glorified body and immortality. And that's what perfection means. Perfection means you can't die and you can't sin. Perfection means you cannot die and you cannot sin. I don't think you heard that. Perfection means you cannot die and you cannot sin. As most of you know, I'm an apostle. I've been an apostle since 19, since December, January 90, 1996, 1997. What's an apostle? An apostle is given a specific direction from God, a specific calling for something to do. It could be go preach the gospel in Asia and open churches in Asia. It could be go to Myanmar and open churches. Or it could be open new areas of the gospel and show the church where they need to go in new areas of the gospel. My apostleship is very simple. Instead, I want you to teach my people how to be alive and remain when Jesus returns. That's simple. How to teach my people to be alive and remain when Jesus returns. I had no clue how to do that, no clue how to get started, and what he wanted me to do. Here I am almost 30 years later, and it's done. My job was to get the, hear from God, do the teaching, get the lessons out, build the websites. We have live now, or in progress, about 20 websites. We have eight schools, if you call Book of Revelation a school, which is 60 videos, sound like a school to me. It has more videos than healing school. Okay. Uh, Book of Revelation the same way, living and dying the same way. Okay. The uh, Salvation Made Plain, well, it's at around 60 videos now, it's not done yet. The videos have been taught, they just have to be <sighs> gone over by me and then loaded. And it's not at the top of my priority list right now. All of that to teach these people how to be alive and remain when Jesus returns. Now, if you look in Ephesians 4, it talks about the five-fold offices. Let me read that to you. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles. Well, let's back up to 10. He that descended is the same that also ascended up above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Fivefold officers. This country is not very big in apostles. Uh, an ABC was telling me a few days ago, he said, I was listening on the radio driving into work and the man was teaching that there are, no, there are no apostles. They all died off. I guess that when the last apostle fell off his horse, that was the end of that. Well, unfortunately, with all due respect, he's wrong. And I can prove it from the, I will prove it from the scriptures right here. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Why? Next verse. For the perfecting of the saints. While the fivefold ministry is for the perfecting of the saints, you see any saints running around who are perfected? I don't. That means we still need a minister. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. As twice it uses the word perfect. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
it gives the definition of a perfect man. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. A perfect man. Now, God, when he makes things, they're perfect. God can't make something that's imperfect. I mean, I would think that's part of the definition of who God is. Whatever he does is perfect. Yet, when God reviewed what he had done in the, in the six days, looked at his work for the six days, he said his work was very good. He did not say it was perfect. Wow. What mistake did you make, God? Didn't make a mistake. But the dude in charge was going to make a mistake. See? God could make perfect people if he wanted. He didn't want to make perfect people. He wanted to give you free choice and the ability to decide. Do I want to live for God and do whatever God says? Live for him totally? If you decide to live for God and live for him totally, I mean, do it not just words, then you'd end up being perfect. That's what Adam was supposed to do. Give him all thought and dominion over the earth, but not the heavenless. He needed to learn how to handle the heavenless. And not the underworld. He needed to learn that. God spent time with him teaching him. And most of all, he needed to learn how to live and not die. Because he had a glorified body. He was so full of the glory of God, he didn't need clothes. But he could sin. Of course, there's only one sin he could do, which is to eat the fruit. But if you sin, you die. Anybody who can sin is not perfect. Anybody who can die is not perfect. We can only be perfect through the work of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 10, 14 says, By one sacrifice, he has perfected, perfected and sanctified you. He paid the price for you to be perfect and sanctified. And that's what we're talking about here. How do we get there? How do we get there? Well, we have looked at the fact that we need to believe that every word we say comes to pass and what that means in your heart. We looked at who used to pray that way. We need to copy them and be like them. And we've seen that the church today is living under the age of grace where they're totally uh, the more mature part of the church is living in the age of the grace where they are using the name of Jesus, using the name of Jesus, not Christ. His name is Jesus, not Christ. And the power is in the name of Jesus, not Christ. And they're praying in the name of Jesus and they're going through all what Jesus said they should do. The five baptism and all the things that we should do. They may not realize they're doing some of those things, but they are, for the most part. But they're tied into the name of Jesus, which is wonderful now. But as we pointed out last time, at the end of the age of grace, the name of Jesus goes away. We no longer have access to it. And Jesus gets a new name. Revelation 2 and 3 talks about getting new names. So what are we going to do at the end of the age of grace, like I said, if you're pre-trib, so are meaningless to you, but if you're pre-trib, I implore you, go look at rapturemadeplain.org. The most important thing you can do for you, your life, your health, your wealth, and your family is go watch rapturemadeplain.org if you are still a pre-tribber. So what happens when you come to the age of grace and you can no longer use the name of Jesus? How are you going to pray? What are you going to do? That's what we're teaching about here. And I've been emphasizing the urgency because I believe Jesus is coming back in 2028, which I've talked about from different directions, and there's a video on it. Now you say, what if you're wrong? Well, I point to the achievements of the church to say the probability of being wrong isn't very high. I believe it not because of the two sequences of scriptures, which point to 28, 20, which I share with you. I believe it because I believe God told me that. Personally, in 1983. So I believe it. Now, I'm not asking you to believe it based on that. I'm asking you to believe it based on the two sequences of scriptures and what all the eschatologists are trying to say. And the scriptures. But suppose I'm wrong. And suppose he doesn't come back in 2020. What have you done? 
what you've done is chosen to live the way God wants you to live. He wants you to live in the, as an adult in the family of God. He wants you to have so much of him in your heart that when you say, mountain move, you don't need to say in the name of Jesus. He wants you to have, see, when we use the name of Jesus, we're relying on his righteousness. We have been made the righteousness of God because of Jesus Christ. Our spirit is righteous. And we are relying on his faith because he gave us his name. So we are relying on his righteousness and his faith and his name. We're living by the faith of the Son of God who saved us. But when you say you're going to use Mark 11, 23, without the name of Jesus, you're saying, I have taken the righteousness of God, which God put into my spirit as a gift, and I've worked it out into my members as holiness, which is what the Bible says you should do. Repeatedly and over and over. Take the righteousness of God in your spirit and work it out into your members as holiness. So you're a holy church for a holy God. And then your faith is not being vested in the name of Jesus. Your faith is being, being vested directly in the word of God. The word of God says, if I set the mountain, then move it, it moves. The word of God says, if I agree with somebody, it's done. The word of God says, I have all thought and dominion over the earth and everything on it. And in fact, because I'm not born again, I have authority in three worlds, above the earth and under the earth. You have authority over angels and over demons. And you have that authority without the name of Jesus. If you take the righteousness in you and work it out into your flesh as holiness, and if you believe the word of God and you live by it and you live a lifestyle where every time you open your mouth, you believe it's going to come to pass. Every time you say a word, you believe it's going to come to pass. In fact, you want it to come to pass. Every word. So there's no place for foolish testing, which is what God keeps reminding me. Get away from foolish testing. That's what it's all about. Everything we've been told over and over to do it. But people have a habit, which God chided me about recently, I keep saying people have a habit that they often don't want to do something unless they understand why. Just because God said it is not enough. Just because the Bible says it is not enough. They need to understand why. It turns out I was doing the same thing recently. And God pointed it out to me. Let me tell you, you don't want that to be pointed out to you because the circumstances at the point of the pointing out may not be nice. Do it because the word of God says it. Do it because the Spirit of God said it. Don't do it because you understand it. If you understand it, that's not faith. That's just knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Do it because God said it. Do it because the Word says it. And if you do that, your blessings will be beyond anything you can imagine. So I think I just covered A, B, C, and D. Okay? What indeed should I mention? I think I did a pretty job, good job covering it all. You know, remember Hebrews 6 verse 1, you all know well, which comes after talking about feeding and strong meat, feeding and strong meat, and being able to differentiate between good and evil. Not based on the gifting of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit go away at the, end of, at the end of the age of grace. This is based on you and who you are and what God has taught you and how you're committed to Him. So Hebrews 6.1 Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Exactly what I'm saying here. Going on to perfection. Let's start practicing how to pray without the name of Jesus. Not all the time. Sometimes. Sometimes. Practice it. The more this becomes a reality in you, is the more you will suddenly 
start doing it without realizing it. I remember there was a period of time when I started telling people that, that the devil couldn't kill me. That was about, oh, roughly, what? It was about 1997 or 98, somewhere around there. I started teaching to what would become, well, what was the beginning of ABC churches, that the devil couldn't kill me. Well, then, you know, he really increased the effort to try to kill me. One weekend between Friday and Monday morning, I went through 13 major attacks, one of which was people would call a heart attack. That's between Friday and Monday, okay? But what I want to tell you about is this one. I'm driving on the freeway. I also had people driving, certainly one comes to mind vividly, driving in my lane and coming towards me. We're going at high speed and it's in my lane coming towards me. Not on the freeway, on a four-lane highway. In my lane coming towards me. That kind of sticks in my mind for some reason. The other one that jumps in my mind, which is what I want to tell you, I'm driving on the freeway and it's a truck ahead of me and the back is open and suddenly this big box falls out right in front of me and start bouncing towards me. So I was talking to my sister, one on the wheel, talking to her like this. I see the box coming towards me and I'm saying a long sentence. You know what I did? I simply raised my hand and pointed to the box and kept on talking. And the box bounced, slid, bounced, and then just bounced out of the way. I went right back. Just boom, boom, boom. That's it. All I did was stuck up my hand. I didn't use the name of Jesus, Jesus, did not use the name of Jesus, did not pray. I stuck my hand out. It was automatic. You start believing and understanding you are an adult in the family of God and every word comes to pass and you have the authority and power and the glory of God is in you, you'll find yourself doing things like that. I could tell you <laughs> a lot of stories. I could tell you, we were ministering to somebody and they decided to uh, break my, uh, crush my larynx. And the person lunged at me to crush my larynx and in the word of the person, who well, thereafter a uh, uh, person's life was changed, the person said something, grab the person in mid-ear, grab them, Grab the person in the middle and lower the person down to the floor gently. I didn't never made a move. Things like this should happen all the time. Not people trying to kill you. <laughs> the good part, not the bad part. Okay. <laughs> you know, since I've been casting out demons at ABC, probably six people have either tried to kill me or told me they wanted to kill me. Here at ABC. In this, yeah. Let me tell you. What I'm telling you is meant to change your life so you can be alive and remain when Jesus returns. There's an urgency to start doing it. And don't wait till you understand it. Start doing it. So with that, we get to part E. Party, Jesus and the church. Now, remember I said the kingdom of God is like a seed. And that's what the entire process is all about. It's a seed. Where we are today, ABC Church, you really have three choices. Each of you has three choices. You can take the position of what we call like the free grace people. Everybody is saved by grace. You don't need to do anything. Hopefully, you have been at ABC long enough to see the errors of those ways. See? One of the key scriptures is, God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't play favorites, and neither should we. One of the worst sins there is, is respecter of persons. I know a pastor and his wife, they both died because he was a respecter of persons. Okay? So, if God is not a respecter of persons, and God doesn't play a favorites, then whatever he requires of one, he requires of me. Here I am, what does he require of me? Well, he requires a lot more than what I'm doing, but look at me. You know some of the things I've been doing. Some people say you're a fanatic. 
But you see, if I'm right, then I know I'm right, and the scripture says I'm right. Then he requires you to be a fanatic also. How many fanatics do you know on the Dodgers and the Rams and movies? Their lives are built around them. Video games, drugs, sex. All fanatics. What's wrong with being a fanatic for God? And understand this. If I'm right and I'm a, I'm a fanatic for God and he's no respecter of person, he wants you to be a fanatic. What does he want from me? He wants me to be led by the Word of God and the Spirit of God 24 hours a day. I know that. It's very clear in the Scriptures. It means he wants that from you also. Now for most of the church, that doesn't end up going to hell by making a mistake as they taking the mark of the beast and worshiping the beast, etc. The day will come when they'll be required to do the same thing. My gosh, Moses had to do it. Moses made one mistake, which you and I would call a miracle. He hit a rock and water came out. But that wasn't what God told him to do. God said, speak to the rock. And because of that, he could not enter the promised land. He wanted perfect obedience. That's what he wants from all of us. Perfect obedience. And what if he doesn't get it? It's your choice. It's all a filtering process. And you decide if you want to filter upwards or not. Where you are today, you can, the three basic positions. One is, you can be somewhat like the great free grace church, which is, uh, Jesus took care of everything. We're under grace. I don't need to worry about it. And in fact, it's pre trip You can take that position. You'd be wrong in every single statement, but you can take it. You can take the position, we continue the way we are today at ABC, partnering with God, seeing all these miracle signs and wonders, and partnering with Him until He returns. You can take that position, but when the end of the age of grace comes, which it will, you will be in a really bad place. You won't be prepared. Or you can say, well, I've known Pastor Joshua for a long, long time. People start calling him apostle before he ever told anybody. Both overseas. I spoke at a, to a, a large church, okay? And uh, they asked me to speak there. And I, I remember it wasn't, I think I spoke like a Wednesday night and then two Sunday mornings in a row. And uh, either the first Sunday or the second Sunday morning, he was introduced to me. He said, here is a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. I don't know what he is, but he's a great teacher. That was his introduction. He had no idea what it was. I'm not into titles. What I was was an apostle, but I didn't tell him. It's not important. It's important now to ABC because they need to know. You've got to make decisions. You want to believe Pastor Joshua or not? You want to believe Apostle Joshua or not? Your choice. I'm telling you what I've been called to do. You know my history. You know, twice I was so fed up with this world, I said, Lord, Psalm 91, verse 16, said I can take, ask you to take my spirit out of my body anytime. I'm ready to go. Both times, he had me stay. So I'm not here because I'm enjoying this world or to teach or to write a book. I'm here to tell God's people who want to learn how to be alive and remain when God returns, when Jesus returns. That's what I'm here for. And I'm telling you, this is what God is teaching me. This is the way to do it. And the people are not following it. You know, I taught interval living three years ago. How many of you are practicing interval living? Yet it's key to the matrix. In fact, the matrix is an expansion of interval living. How many are you in the matrix? How many are you are doing, uh, practicing being under grace by doing USBs. That's a lot easier, so I imagine more of you are doing that. What is the whole package deal? <laughs> the whole package deal. It's not going to the store and pick up this one, another one. They all go together. They fit together. And that's the way God taught it. That's the way he taught it through me. It's the package deal. One step at a time. Well, here we are. So, what is it all about? Jesus and the church. It's about 
the kingdom of God is like a seed. And one of the things about being a seed is you grow gradually, but another part is you plant seeds to reap a harvest. You plant seeds to reap a harvest. Jesus wants to reap a harvest. What kind of harvest? Well, Romans 8.29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God wants Jesus to be the firstborn and then brethren. Scripture says we are joined ears with Jesus. Everything that Jesus owns, we own it jointly with him. Which is why we can come on all these things. So now, we're not joined ears with Jesus in the name of Jesus. We're joined ears with Jesus, period. But you can't use it until you've taken the righteous inside you and start to move it outside in holiness and believe the word of God and believe that whatever you say shall come to pass. It's a whole package deal. So, so God sent his son. He sowed a son expecting to get back many sons. Most fundamental law of the Bible. Law of Genesis. Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. Everything produces of its own kind. Let us see what Jesus did with it. God saw Jesus to get back more sons. What did Jesus do? Let's turn in your Bibles, please, to John. And Pastor Matthew says, I know where he's going. Right, Pastor Matthew? John chapter 12, verse Let's look at 23. It's a nice scripture. John chapter 12, verse 23. Everybody got it? Okay. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That's pretty awesome. So the, son, the hour is come that he should be glorified. So what is, what's the first thing he says? Verily, verily. Truly, truly. I'm not telling you a lie. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides it alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. That's what he's going to do with himself. He is going to die to bring forth all of us as a brethren, as his brothers, as his sisters, as adults in his family that his father wants. So that's what he's going to do. Then he did it. What does he want us to do? Next scripture. He that loves his life shall lose it. That's pretty blunt. If you love your life, you lose it. <laughs> you know, that's not a hyperbole. That's not a nice simile, an analogy. It's blunt truth. If you love your life, you lose it. You may not lose it in this age, because you may squeak through, not as an overcomer, but you may squeak through. Not very likely. Let's look at it this way. That's the better way to look at it. You know, we all have loved ones who've gone to heaven. I mean, believers who've gone to heaven. And if you're a free, gift, free grace person, you think it's all over there in heaven. By gosh, they're in streets of gold, they have no cares, no worries. That's not a true statement. <laughs> it's wrong in two places. See, to be absent of the body is to be the Lord. They are with the Lord. But only when they are absent from the body. No. What happens to them, those of us with our loved ones who have gone on, depends on whether they died in Christ or died in Jesus. And if you don't know what that means, I refer, refer you to our website, Jesus the Christ Made Plain. That's what it's about. Living in Christ or living in Jesus. If they died in Jesus, they're absent from the body and they're with the Lord. The God, it says 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 14. Okay? God will bring back the dead in Jesus when he comes. 
God is coming back in a thousand years. He's coming to earth. New Jerusalem is, this is my phraseology, not the Bible, it's like heaven on earth, part of heaven on earth. Anyway, he's coming back to live in New Jerusalem on earth. When he comes back, he brings back all those who died in Jesus with him. The dead in Christ, when Jesus comes at the rapture, the dead in Christ will go up first to meet Jesus, and then we who are alive and remain shall go up with the next. So the dead in Jesus is a good example. The dead in Jesus were not here to hear me teach us. They were not here to hear me say, these words are not hyperbole. He says, if you, lose, if you love your life, you lose it. No, these people have lost their lives, but I'm not talking about that. A lot of them are great people, wonderful people. Some of them are greater men and women of God than I am. But here's what I've got that they don't. I'm an apostle called to teach us. They're not. So they may be better than me in every single dimension except that one, but that's the one that counts right now because that's the one that gets us ready to be alive and remain when Jesus returns. So the dead in Jesus go up to heaven. When they die, technically they don't, they don't go to heaven, they go to paradise, but I won't go into that here. So they go to paradise and then they're reunited with their bodies. Well, what happens to them depends on what they do in their bodies because the scripture comes back into play. If they love their lives, they will lose it, except that next time it will be to the lake of fire. Same thing he requires of me and you here, he will require of them when they come back to earth. The dead in Christ already gave up their lives for Christ. Martyrs are a great example. They may not understand a lot, but they know this. I'm never going to give up my life. So if ISIS, like ISIS cut their head off because they were next to uh, Muhammad, they're dead in Christ. They didn't love their life enough to change. They love the gospel. They love Jesus. They love God more than their life, and they became dead in Christ. That's what it takes to be alive in Christ, or dead in Christ. We want to be alive in Christ. We want to be alive and remain and wait until Jesus returns. And we don't have a lot of time to change. Why? Because the time of harvesting is coming near. Jesus and the church. God sowed Jesus to get back many brethren. Jesus wanted to sow our lives to give it to him in the gospel. So we have a better life and lead people to Jesus. So we raise up more brethren. Matthew 8, Matthew, from the outline, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. King James says, end of the world. King James uses end of the world six times. Four times have to do with the context of the end. The other two have different contexts, okay? But the word world could have been translated as age, which in some places it is. The end of the age. The age reference here is not the, the age of grace. At first I thought it was, but as I checked out the other scriptures, it's the age Jesus is with us until the end of uh, the first 1,000 years. He is ruling us with a rod of iron for the first 1,000 years. There is no grace, it's law. You keep the law and you live under the law those who are living in the 1,000 years, which won't be us because we'll be alive and remain and be raptured and we'll be ruling over them. So we'll have glorified bodies and be ruling over them. Both those who are there who don't have glorified bodies will be living a life under law. 
He's saying, I'm with you always, even to the end of that age. No, the, the commandment here to go preach a gospel ends at the end of Age of Grace. That's why I thought this reference to the end of Age of Grace. In this scripture, you would think that. But if you look at the other uses of the end of the world, you see it's not. Like, for example, the sheep and the tears. The sheep and the goat and the tears and the wheat. You see, it really is referring to when God comes to earth. Jesus will be with us until God comes to the earth. No, you're not praying in the name of Jesus. You're obeying what he says. It's a right of iron. And it says, that, and I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of your redemption. The Holy Spirit, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of your redemption. The day of your redemption, for us right now, will be the day you're raptured. At that point, you're no longer sealed by the Holy Spirit, because you become a perfect man, a son of God, and you don't need a seal of protection. The 144,000 were sealed with a protection. And the protection is mentioned. You know, the stuff happening to the earth, the wind blowing, all the stuff. They needed that seal of protection. We need it until we grew up. The day we are raptured, we no longer need the seal of the Holy Spirit. So that ends then. But the Holy Spirit remains with you forever. Forever. It will always be inside you. Forever. That's a whole different teaching. Okay? So after the end of grace, what happens after the end of grace? It's a time of reaping the harvest. It's reaping the harvest of what Jesus did. He came, God sowed him, he came, he did his sowing, and now after the end of the age of grace, there's reaping a harvest. The harvest is reaped after the end of the age of grace. That's why the church, another reason why the church can't just zoom out of here. So, there are three harvests that I mentioned here. They are in the order of importance, not chronological order. Mark 4.29, when the fruit is brought forth, immediately the, the gardener, the farmer, puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Ephesians 5.27, this is showing you when the fruit is ready. Ephesians 5.27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's it. We, washed by the water of the word, we come to the rapture ready to be perfected. We're not perfected. We're part of the glorious church. We could sin, but we're not sinning. We could die, but not unless we sin, and we're not sinning. So we come to the rapture, and he halves us and gives us perfection. Those alive in Christ are reaped and presented to Jesus. That is the equivalent of the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, crossing into the promised land, and everybody else did not make it. The fruit of that entire adventure was Joshua and Caleb and the younger fruit, the younger generation were potentials. That's it. So the fruit of all that Jesus did, the primary fruit is for you and me to be alive and remain when Jesus returns. That is the fruit. That is the harvest. What's another harvest? Revelation 12 verse 5. The 144,000 who were sealed in Revelation uh, 7. She, in Revelation 12, is refer referred to. She brought forth a man-child, which I believe, based on my understanding of the scriptures, the scripture does not say that clearly. She brought forth a man-child, the which I'm saying is 144,000, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and the child was caught up unto God and to the throne. The 144,000 are men who are going to be caught up before the rapture. 
the, the qualifications are spelled out in at the beginning of Revelation uh, 14. Revelation 14, okay? And uh, they have never known women, so they're virgins. They have no guile in their mouth. Two big keys, no lies, no deceit in their mouth. And they've never known women. And they're all Jewish. They are men, men, because they have lived and they are now being taken up as a man in the family of God. But they're children because they don't know the gospel. They don't know the things that you people know. So they're a man going up to the Lord, but a child because they have to learn all these things. And thereafter, we see them with Jesus all the time because he's teaching them. Man child. Finally, in Revelation 14, verses 14 through 15, right before this, it says, it says that blessed are those who die in the Lord from here on out and their works follow them. I think I got the quote correctly. Blessed are those who die in the Lord and uh, their works follow them. The key point I wanted to make there is their works follow them. Their works follow them. They are going to get, saved is not the right word, they are going to get caught up with God and make it in because they accepted martyrdom. They may not understand it. All they may know is an angel came by my house and said, don't take the mark of the beast and don't worship the beast. And so they said, I'm not going to do it. Says, you want to cut my head off? Go ahead. Whatever their reason is, they're martyrs. And so they are reaped first. The martyrs are reaped. And in verses 14 and 15, I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Trust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And these are the ones who have refused to take the mark of the beast and worship the beast, and they are harvested. They are all overcomers. Uh, and they are all given a crown of life. And they are the only group mentioned in Revelation 20 when it talks about all the judges sitting on the thrones and Jesus dealing with Satan. The only group mentioned is this group. That's the only group mentioned. They are martyrs. Then following that comes the reaping of those who had taken the mark of the beast, those who had lived for the devil, uh, and uh, those who rejected whatever they did. They are then all killed, and their blood runs out for 200 miles. So many are killed, the blood goes out 200 miles. That's the ones who either took the mark of the beast or worshipped the beast or in some ways totally rejected God, rejected God, rejected Judaism, rejected Christianity. And they're all killed. And by the way, Israel, in a lot of ways, is a very secular country. You would not believe it, but they are very secular. So, And then after the harvest, the millennial kingdom. All those who go into the millennial kingdom, the sheep who go in, they shall be ruled with a rod of iron. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he should smite the nations. And then final scripture I want to show is in Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb is in New Jerusalem. Not the throne of God and Jesus. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in New Jerusalem. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, that is the ending of part two. Next Sunday we do part three, which is called Living with the Seal of the Spirit. And that will be the final part in the series, Your Godlike Lifestyle. Thank you all very much.
Thank you, Apostle Joshua. A lot of meat there. I'm going to have to go back over that outline again. Go through the scriptures. And most of all, ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to help us to understand, to see where we are, and where we're going. Because this is so pertinent. We're in the last of the last days, and we need to be highly aware. God, through the book of Revelation and other prophecies, he's letting us know what to expect, what to do, how to act. So, again, Apostle Joshua is our guide. Holy Spirit has been speaking through him mightily, sharing things with him that people are saying, how is that possible that you would know that? Well, we're called to be in, in time ministry. This is what it's all about. You're in the right place at the right time. So grab hold and let's run together, hand in hand with the Holy Spirit and Jesus, following the lead of Apostle Joshua, that we may cross that river of death and go into our promised land, which for us will be the rapture, the catching away of the church. That's our goal. Hallelujah. So right now, why don't we each confess any known sins, do a USP, and we'll prepare to partake of communion together. Okay? So be back in just a moment. Oh, Lord, this is so awesome that you have chosen to share your body and your blood with us on an ongoing basis. Your sacrifice was a once for all. You paid the price in full and complete, and it all belongs to us. But one of the ways that we receive, because it stays there in the spiritual realm until we pull it out until we receive it, until we walk in it. And one of those ways is through partaking of communion of the body and the blood of Jesus, that Jesus has made that available for us, and we are so blessed, and we are so grateful. So on that night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and said, take this, eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember he's saying this to each one of us. We need to personalize it. He did this for you. He did this for me. This is all about Jesus and me, the sacrifice and my receiving of those benefits. And we know that when Jesus took those 39 stripes upon his body, he was paying the price for all sickness, disease, infirmity, and pain that would ever be known to mankind. He already knew. I just keep saying this, but we got to remember, Jesus knows it all. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's coming, and he's paid the price for everything that we would ever need, every sickness and disease that we haven't even heard of yet. He's known about and he's paid the price for it. For the word of God makes it clear we have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We are the healed of the Lord and we say so. We say so. We are the healed of the Lord. We let heaven, hell, and earth know where we stand for we stand on the word of God, which is very clear as to what the benefits are for us. God's people, his children, his sons, his daughters. So let's partake together now of the broken body of Jesus in exchange to receive healing, wholeness, restoration, and rejuvenation for any and all parts of our bodies. In Jesus' name. And in the same manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and said, 
This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for remission from sins. <sighs> wow. That's a once for all sacrifice. It had never been like that before. It was always an annual payment. But Jesus made it all possible for it to be all sins, all wages of sins, all negativities, all paid for. And we can walk in his righteousness in the power of his might. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for we have victory in you, victory through you, through your body, through your blood. We have life. We have healing. We have strength. We have all that we need is in you, Jesus. We are complete in Jesus Christ. We have all we need in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. We are grateful. Words just sometimes seem so inadequate. But you know our hearts. And we love you, Lord. And we now, together in unity, partake of the precious blood of Jesus Christ, this cup of blessing, this cup of life. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. And so what did we say? That we are the healed of the Lord and we say so? Okay, ABCers, let's say so right now. 20 times of I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Ready? I Well, let's know. Let's do we've been healed. We've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We've been healed by stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Remember when we say we, that includes the I, because we're talking about the whole body here of ABC. And as far as Jesus is concerned, it's for the whole body of Christ, but we are claiming it for ourselves. We are receiving what belongs to us through our speaking that word and receiving the healing. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. So awesome.